And good morning. Welcome once again to Portland Bible Church, currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. Thank you so much for joining with us, those that are here in person, those who are live streaming on Judy Glennie's Facebook page. Remember, you can also find us at the website, portlandbiblechurch.com, and there's a uh, section at the top there for services, and there's a drop-down menu. <clears throat> And there's a link there to YouTube, and so we post those immediately after service. I understand that Judy was, my wife Judy was telling me that we had quite a few more on YouTube than we used to have. So praise the Lord for that. Thank you so much for joining with us, being part of our family. We think of uh, all the folks who are live and in person here. Well, I guess you're all live. It's, it looks like it. And in person. And all those that are uh, at some distance, so our congregation spans a great distances, actually have some folks over there in Uganda and uh, all over the world. So it's just amazing what God can do. Uh, Satan means things for evil, but as we had to uh, vacate our premises and we went on the uh, internet, why uh, we've expanded our outreach. So we thank the Lord for that. Thank you for being a part of our congregation. Remember, our services are right now 10 o'clock Sunday morning and 11.15. Uh, after our second service, we have some time. We sing the great hymns of the church. So if you can join with us for fellowship and worship in song, uh, we do that on Sunday morning. On Thursday at 7 o'clock, we have our Bible study. Currently, we're studying the book of Ephesians. We just got started. So uh, you're just in time to get it the, in on the ground floor, as it were, at the beginning of the book of Ephesians. So that's on Thursday. And after our Thursday class, beginning at 7, we have a prayer time afterwards. So if you have prayer requests, praises, thanksgivings, anything like that, give us a call. Drop us a line. We'll be sure to include your prayer request and or your praises. A uh, <clears throat> couple of announcements uh, just to run through these. We've been announcing periodically, I'm sure most people are familiar, uh, about the PatriotAcademy.com. You can go to the website, PatriotAcademy.com. The reason we keep announcing this is it's so essential to understand our Constitution, which is the really the basis of the freedom that we have in this country. And so without freedom, we're going to lose our ability to teach the Word of God freely. And so it's important that we understand our rights as citizens and the Constitution. And this particular website, PatriotAcademy.com, uh, with Rick Green and David Barton, two consummate experts on all things constitutional and with regard to the Declaration of Independence, the Founding Fathers, and all the founding documents on which our nation is based. So I make no apology for reminding you to check it out if you haven't, PatriotAcademy.com. By the way, there's a lot of training going on all over the country. I understand over several hundred thousand people have already gone through the training, Judy and I have, where they go through and dissect our Constitution, Bill of Rights, and it's just a marvelous thing. I didn't realize how much I did not understand about our Constitution, and so it's been a, a great learning experience. You can be part of that if you want. Uh, in addition, if you're still trying to find out information on the virus of uh, the past several years, you can go to covid.daystar.com. It's a Christian network, and they have all the information there, and you can make your decision with regard to what you would do and how you would take care of that if you end up with uh, loved ones or yourself having the virus. So covid.daystar.com. And then there was a new one that we heard just uh, recently. Uh, this one is starting up, and it's going to give you an opportunity to connect with doctors who are uh, understanding the reality of the virus and other things. And so if you want that, it's goldcare.com. Like gold, you know, gold and silver, gold care, just like it sounds, G-O-L-D-C-A-R-E.com. And this is for uh, uh, doctors. It's also going to, they're going to be opening medical centers uh, with doctors who are uh, do not have some type of agenda based on uh, the tyranny that has happened over the last several years. So those things are available to you. We have other uh, websites from time to time. And there's another one you might look at. It's called Truth for Health. Truth for Health, all one word, truthforhealth.org. Check those out and uh, see if they're operational and what information they have. And so I think you might enjoy uh, checking that information out as well. And then, of course, we have our local church here, and I was reminded by uh, my board of deacons that I always forget to mention giving. 
Uh, I realize that uh, people are all over the world now listening, and some people wonder how they can give to this ministry. So if you want to know how to give to the ministry of Portland Bible Church, you simply would write to the address, and you can send a check or money order, whatever you want to do, uh, and send it to uh, Gary Glenny, my address. It's on the website. You can go there. And uh, has under the services, I think, uh, at the main menu there, there's a place. Uh, see, it's not service. What is it? Uh, contact. Under contact. And we have our address there. But make sure on the envelope that you put Portland Bible Church. So when they come here, I don't open those. I put them right into our grace box over here for the men to take care of. I have nothing to do with the money in this local church. Uh, we have missionaries that we support, or at least we have in the past. Because of the two years of the so-called uh, virus, we have had uh, a downturn in some of the giving, and so we haven't been able to support the missionaries that we have uh, endorsed over the years, and we'd like to be able to do that again. So please consider giving. That's portlandbiblechurch.com is the website. My address is there under contacts, and make sure your envelope, as well as your check, if you make it out, make it out to Portland Bible Church, and that will help my uh, deacons to take care of the finances. So uh, remember that the scripture is quite clear. It says every person, every man, every person as he purposes or as she purposes in their own heart, so let them give, not grudgingly or out of necessity. There's no pressure to give in the dispensation of the church. All giving is grace. Uh, there is no uh, uh, prescribed amount or percentage. And so uh, uh, as you purpose in your heart, without grudging or out of necessity, God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, well, I think that's the information that I had by way of introduction. And we always take some time for silent prayer at the beginning of each of our Bible studies so that you can acknowledge to the Father any sins that you're aware of. Keep in mind that one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, certainly to convict the unbelievers of sin so that they might have uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith alone in his finished work. But I believe the Holy Spirit also convicts and reminds us as believers of sins. Sins, of course, would be those things that transgress the law of God. It's quite clear through Scripture, and even in the heart of man, we understand that there are things that are right and things that are wrong. And if you understand that as a believer and understand the issue of sin, we can acknowledge that because it has been paid for. Every sin has been paid for on the cross. But when we commit a sin in this life as believers, we need to acknowledge the fact that Christ died for that sin. So we confess that sin. We name it. We cite it. We agree with God that it's a sin, and then it is forgiven and actually forgotten. And at that point, we believe that we fulfill the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 9 is one of the quintessential passages that deals with this forgiveness. If we as believers confess our sins, again, name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the ones that we've confessed are forgiven, plus all those that we had forgotten about or didn't even know that we'd committed. At that point, we have the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the mind of Christ, which is the Word of God. So with that in mind and in preparation for our study this morning, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we are so grateful for the freedom that we have in this country to this day, where we can actually study your word and learn those things about who and what you are and your magnificent plan for us and your saving grace and saving work through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this incredible gift and all the blessings that accrue to us in this life and those which will be turned into rewards and blessings forevermore. We thank you for all of these things. And we pray that as we study this morning, you might encourage us motivate us, challenge us, cause us to be understanding of your plan for us so that we might be able to do those things, Father, that are pleasing in your sight. And we give all the honor and glory to you, Father, in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. 
Let my cry come before thee, O Lord, give me understanding according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth this morning to the book of Hebrews. On Sunday morning, we study Hebrews. We have arrived in chapter 10, and actually we're at verse 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can open to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. We have noted that the writer of Hebrews, or I should say your pastor in the same way that the writer of Hebrews does, is to repeat constantly. And so some of you probably feel that the subjects that we cover in the last several classes are the same. And they are because the writer of Hebrews goes over and over these things. We're told that you have to hear something, I think it's uh, 20 times or 21 times or something, before it actually becomes part of your memory and uh, being able to apply it in your life. So I guess that we'd say that the writer of Hebrews accomplishes that because he certainly has gone over the importance of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his bearing of sins on our behalf, and how that replaced all of those thousands and thousands of Levitical offerings down through the uh, Old Testament. And so we see then the whole concept here of uh, uh, salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. So at any rate, if you have your Bible, by the way, you can look at the outline. And in the outline, we're looking at the section on page five. If you want to find our outline, you can go to the website and you have a section there for doctrines. There's also a section for charts, graphs, outlines, maps. So we have a lot of things there available. So you can go uh, to the section dealing with uh, charts, graphs, outlines, and you'll find there the outline of Hebrews that I have developed. Now, the outlines that I develop generally include what many other men and scholars have done, but I also go into a greater depth in my outlines rather than just a quick summary. We've done quick summaries. In fact, we noted in this particular uh, chapter, chapter 10, uh, we noted that if we wanted to summarize it, it's the once and for all time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So that's the summary of chapter 10, and he's going to go over that many times, but basically there are several parts to that. The first four verses looked at the insufficiency of the Levitical sacrifices. In other words, they were year by year, day by day, 365 days a year that they were offering thousands and thousands of animal sacrifices. And of course, we have just passed the festival of Passover, and we described the fact that they would bring in the unblemished uh, lamb uh, from the flock, and they would have it in the house for a number of days. Uh, I think it's five days they would have it in the house, almost become like a pet. Hmm. And the children would love this, having this pet probably slept in their beds. And then five days later, the father had, father had to kill this lamb. You can imagine how, uh, how that would be shocking to the family, but particularly to the children to see this death. And this is, of course, not without purpose. God wanted us, all members of the human race, to understand that there is a penalty for sin. And of course, he doesn't kill the children or the parents, but he does have them kill this lamb as a sacrifice to represent the fact that God requires a sacrifice, a live sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice. Well, that sets up the fact that Jesus Christ became, as John said in his gospel, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ did once and for all what all of these thousands and thousands of animal sacrifices did. And the fact that you would be attached to this animal and be sad to see it die, we should be tenfold, a thousand times fold, that Jesus Christ died for our sins because all of those sacrifices pointed to it. And the writer of Hebrews is basically going over that and over that and over that so that we never forget the miraculous salvation that we have through the shed blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. And then the next section from 5 to 10 is Messiah's sacrifice, which replaced all the Levitical sacrifices of the past. Now, we saw this in chapter 9 as well, so we made a note of the fact that the writer of Hebrews is not going to let go of this theme. And eventually, he's going to get into a section of application in chapters 12 and 13, and that will be great because everybody says, you know, well, so what does this mean to me? What do I need to do? Okay, the writer of Hebrews is going to get there, but you're going to have to wait till chapter 12 and 13 for the application. 
I was in a church one time and uh, the dear saints in that church, some of the lovely ladies said, Pastor, we just wish you'd give more application. I said, well, I teach what's in the word of God. And when it has applications, we teach them. And when it has historic information and prophetic information, I teach that. And so when you come to church, sometimes we're not hitting the particular subject that you'd like to hear but we teach the whole counsel of God's word. So whether this happens to be the hot button for you uh, in terms of what your life situation is or your circumstance is beside the point. The word of God is alive and powerful and it is edifying to our soul no matter where we are in the scripture. And so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you should enjoy any passage of scripture because it is your very life, it is uplifting, and it will help you to be able to function even though it may not hit or touch on the very problem that you have in your life right now. So bear with us. We'll get to your problem sooner or later because every problem that mankind has is addressed somewhere in the scripture. You can count on that. So at any rate, we're in chapter 10 and verse 5. And in this particular section, if you've been with us in the previous weeks, you'll know that uh, the writer of Hebrews quotes more verses from the Old Testament than almost every other writer in the New Testament, other than John in his Revelation, and of course, uh, quite a few in the book of Matthew, also written to a Hebrew audience, giving them the gospel. And so we see here in this particular, what we call Hebrew epistle, the epistle to the Hebrews, he addresses uh, so many Old Testament passages, and here we go again. In verse 5 of chapter 10, he's going to start quoting uh, in the book of Psalms, and it's interesting. Sometimes people say, well, I looked in the Old Testament, and it's not the same. No, many, cas many cases it's not exactly the same. So we understand that the writer of the New Testament takes a passage from the Old Testament and quotes it, and um, he does not amend it in that he changes it, as we would think of, but actually adds to it new information. And this is under the inspiration of God. So just as the Old Testament Psalms and all of the other Old Testament verses that are quoted in the New Testament, sometimes they are, as it were, upgraded. And we talk about this in our computer. Uh, we don't, uh, we have a computer, we don't, the old program in the computer wasn't bad, but we have an upgrade. We have new information that's added, uh, new applications and so forth. And the New Testament has an upgrade, if you will, to the Old Testament. Everything in the New Testament is based on the Old Testament, but we have these upgrades where under inspiration, God has given these writers of the New Testament additional information. So sometimes we see that the verses quoted are slightly altered in the New Testament, and that's okay. That's not saying, oh, there's an error in Scripture. He didn't, didn't he know what the Word said in the Psalms? Uh, he changed it up. Well, the essence is the same, but sometimes he has uh, updated it. I, I like that, upgraded it, like we upgrade our computer from time to time. And some of you have upgraded your phones. <laughs> I, I remember I had, a, I had a flip phone for the longest time, and everybody made fun of me. And uh, if you look at some of the old TV shows, they had flip phones with antennas. And to call on the phone, you had to pull out that antenna. I don't know if that even did anything, but people were fascinated by, had to pull it out like, testing, testing, over, uh, you know, I'm here at the mall. And so they had all these flip phones, and uh, my wife mocked me for having a flip phone. Finally, I got into the 21st century, 22nd century, and, uh, and got a nice cell phone, you know, and all that. But even that. Uh, that, I think, is about four or five years old now because they've gone up and upgraded every year and sometimes twice a year. So upgrade is what the Word of God in the New Testament is. It doesn't change the Word of God, but it adds additional information. In fact, Paul, when he writes concerning the dispensation of the church, that was all new information. Uh, the Old Testament has nothing with regard to the dispensation of the church. So does that mean the New Testament is wrong? Well, there are many Jewish people who think it is. It's not part of uh, God's plan. And yet the word of God in the Old Testament feeds into and is that only and it makes sense in the New Testament by virtue of the Old Testament. Now, I don't normally have to explain this to all of the folks that are with us, but there are some out there who don't understand what's the difference, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And so we're understanding that this information is a uh, cohesive whole from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. And so uh, we mention that from time to time. Okay, so in chapter... 
10 and verse 5, uh, we read it this way in the English, for it is, in, uh, I'm sorry, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Basically, we went through this verse in exegesis. We're going to look at several features here again. One of them is this idea that God doesn't desire sacrifice. I had a question from one of my congregation who said, well, I thought he demanded it in the Old Testament. You must do these sacrifices to have fellowship with me. But what he's talking about here is that the people many times were offering sacrifices without having their heart engaged or we might say their mind, their mentality. They were just doing it out of rote memory. Okay, here we go again. We have that sometimes in the New Testament, in the church, where people come to communion and go, oh, brother, uh, we got to take communion again. And yet communion is one of the most important things that we do as worship in the dispensation of the church. That's why I emphasize it so much when I give the communion. I've had people say, well, your communion is so much different. I've never heard all these things. I think that's to the shame of local churches who do not teach the Passover and Christ as he overlaid what we call the bread and the cup. They were part of the Passover, but he added new dimension. What well, was he wrong then? Oh, he changed up the Passover. He changed up the Passover by upgrading it and saying that the bread represented his perfect sinless body and that the cup, the cup of redemption, the third in the traditional ceremony of Passover, represented uh, his work on the cross, his death for sins. And so he upgraded the Passover for us. Paul even says we should celebrate the festival, the old but then the upgrade, and of course we do that when we take the communion. So again, sacrifices, Old Testament, even the offering of um, the communion. But if we take these unworthily, just as the Hebrews in ancient Israel were taking and offering sacrifices without having their heart, their mentality, or their desire to do it involved, then he says those sacrifices stink. I don't like them. Uh, you're wasting your time. You're killing animals needlessly because it means nothing to you. And sacrifice and a ritual without reality is meaningless. I better say that again. Sacrifice and ritual without reality is meaningless. Even if you take the elements of communion, if an unbeliever is in the church and accidentally they take the elements of communion, it's meaningless to them. It, they're not believers. It's no commemoration to them. Uh, there's nothing that's of value to them in taking those elements. Same thing was true in Israel. So it's important that we understand no matter what ritual is involved in the Old or New Testament, you have to understand what's the reality. What do these things speak of? And so when the writer of Hebrews goes over and over this, hopefully it's starting to click in our minds that these rituals are for the reality of the person and work of Jesus Christ and the magnificent salvation that we possess. All right, so we have then uh, here in this verse, the last phrase says, but thou hast prepared a body or a body thou hast prepared for me. Now that in essence does come from the Old Testament. And we noted these are in Psalm 40, verses six, seven, and eight. And if you read them later, not now, but if you go to those later, you'll see that there are some differences. However, the essence is there. And that was prophetic because God had not provided a body. So we would call those prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ and his body and his death on the cross as the substitutionary uh, atoning work that provides our salvation. So we got all the way down to the word body. We started looking at it last time. And rather than do an entire study of the person of Christ, which would take us several hours at, very, at the very least, I wanted to look at two very important aspects of the person of Christ. Of course, one is that he is absolute deity, and the other is that he is perfect and true humanity. And so we're going, to, we're going to give you some verses for that. And we're going to look at some of them, maybe not all of them, so that you have these in your understanding. And this would be good for your own personal study. Because sometimes people would reject that Jesus Christ actually came in human form. In the first, the second, third century, uh, there, there were those who rejected it. And even today, there are cults that reject the literal humanity of Jesus Christ. Maybe that he was just a spirit or something. Uh, and so there's that. And the other side is, of course, uh, even more detrimental, is that he really wasn't God in human form. In fact, when he spoke about the fact that he and the Father were one, people called him a blasphemer. 
and that uh, nobody, uh, God couldn't come in human form. Well, they forgot to read their Old Testament because clearly there a Messiah, a human Messiah was someday going to come. Even Job in the earliest writings of the Bible speaks about the fact that his Redeemer would come and that he would see him. Wow, Job's long dead. How's he going to see the Messiah? Well, he's going to see him because the Messiah came and he lived perfect life, died on the cross, and he's coming again and he's going to establish his kingdom. And you know what? Old Job's going to get to see him right then in his resurrection body. Isn't that magnificent? And so Job was not wrong. But also Moses spoke about a prophet like him that would come and uh, that he would be the one who would be deliver, the true deliverer and so forth. So on and on. And uh, one of the most important passages perhaps in the Old Testament are found in the book of Isaiah 52, uh, 13 to Isaiah 53, 12, where it speaks about a person who is going to come and take away the sins, as it were, of the world. Uh, pretty magnificent. It's why some of the Hebrew people, even to this day, don't want to read Isaiah 52 and 53. Some, of course, try to say, well, it's referring to Israel as a people, not as an individual. But it's impossible because Israel can't deliver Israel. Israel's not perfect, never was, never will be uh, until they're all in resurrection body that believe. But, of course, uh, the fact that there is a person involved there and elsewhere uh, in the in the Psalms, we have looked at, I think, uh, if memory serves, about 22 Psalms, give or take, that are prophetic of the person of Jesus Christ. Over 300 prophecies of Jesus Christ, uh, at least by some count, and many of those in the Psalms address the person, the humanity of Jesus Christ, and how he would come to be the Savior of the world. We've studied those passages in the past, and so these are just in Psalms. But we have Isaiah, we have Moses, we have of Job and others that have discussed that. So I wanted to look at these two facts. One is that Jesus Christ was true humanity and undiminished deity, perfect God in human form. And we're going to look at those passages. So uh, this may seem a little tedious, but I want to go through some of these because it's important. And it talks about not only did he come and have a body prepared for him at the incarnation, but before he came into human form, he was undiminished deity. By the way, we'll just back up a second. Uh, we call this the eternal life conference between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They decided, as best we can tell from the scriptures, that one would come into human history and live like a human being and be a human being in all points, yet at the same time be God. And that person was selected as the second member of the Trinity, as we understand him. We know him by the name Jesus Christ. Old Testament, of course, he was uh, Yeshua which meant deliverer. In fact, Jesus comes from that Hebrew word, yasha, meaning to deliver. But then Jesus told the disciples to pray to the Father. So we know that there's a Father, and he's the planner. Jesus Christ executed the plan because he was voted the one to come into human history. In fact, he was appointed, or we might say elected, to do the job. The Old Testament says Jesus Christ uh, was elected to come into human history to do the job. And of course, once he finished, he said it is finished. He went back to be with the Father and rejoined the other members of the Trinity. But now, with a new human body, a resurrected, glorified body. Also, there is the Holy Spirit. He is a person. Some think he's just ethereal or a mist or because he's uh, the word spirit is used, ruach in the Hebrew and pneuma in the Greek, but it uh, refers to him as a person. And it uses the third person singular he when it refers to him throughout the Bible. He did this. He gives gifts to people in the dispensations here. So we have these three members. They decided among themselves in the unique essence of the Godhead, which in itself is a great mystery, that Jesus Christ would come into human history, this member of the Trinity, and do the work of salvation. So we have the fact that he is both God, deity, and human, that he has taken upon himself human form. Now we call this theologically the hypostasis, or in transliteration, the hypostatic union. The uh, word hypostatic comes from the Greek word hupo, which means under, and stasis, or histemi, which means to stand, to stand under. 
Well, that doesn't really give us a good meaning of the hypostatic union. It means to be in a particular essence, to stand under one, uh, one essence. And that essence is that uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share identical essence. However, they share difference in personality. Father plans, the Son executes a plan, and the Holy Spirit reveals and restores with regard to the plan and regenerates, as we understand from the New Testament. So we have these things then with regard to the members of the Trinity. And so Jesus Christ then took upon himself human flesh in order to fulfill the work of salvation. Now that's the clearest I can make uh, the presentation of who he is. So here are some passages. We talked about now this hypostatic union, which talks about the identity and the essence, the very nature of God, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are under this identical essence. Then there is something called the kenosis, from the verb kenao, and that means to set aside or to render inoperative or to discard. And it speaks of Jesus. We find this, and we looked at it last time, in Philippians 2, 6 through 8. I'm not going to go there. We did it last time. But basically, it says that Jesus set aside, and I don't like that translation in that context. The best way to translate would be, he rendered inoperative, not useless, he rendered inoperative his attributes of deity while in his humanity. Was he still God? Absolutely. But he was a true human being. Therefore, the best way I can describe this, he didn't pull rank. You know, he didn't say, I'm the big cheese here. Basically, he was a servant and he came as the lamb without spot or blemish to save the world. So he did not utilize his divine assets, but rather appealed as you and I do to God the Father, he said, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, pray to the Father. He prayed to the Father, Father, you know, uh, if it be thy will, let this cup pass. He prayed to his Father. That's the way we pray. You don't pray to dear Jesus. People say, oh, well, Jesus is God. He is, but there's a protocol here. And the protocol is the disciples said, how should we pray? And Jesus said, pray this way, our Father. And he prayed that way. So there's an agenda for prayer. And all of these things are essential as well. And so uh, Jesus then, uh, as the humanity, nevertheless rendered inoperative his attributes of divine essence. But he called upon the Father to give him access to the power of the presence of God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, of course, was upon him and therefore gave him the enabling, we might say the energizing, as the God-man. And so everything that Jesus did, he did because the Father gave him the ability, gave him the access to the very presence of his throne, as well as the Holy Spirit who made it possible. So therefore, Jesus did not pull rank, as it were. And when it says that he changed, uh, uh, Satan said to him, well, you can change these uh, stones into little loaves of pumpernickel bread. Uh, I added that, of course. But uh, you can make it into bread. And he says, uh, you know, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, recognizing he knew who he was and he could and when he was hungry, look at a big, nice round rock and think of it as a, a piece of pumpernickel bread. Probably could have called up a miraculous peanut butter and jelly to add on it, you know. But he didn't. And so that wasn't the will of the Father in that case. But when it was the will of the Father, Jesus would pray, not my will, but thine be done with regard to the cross. Humanly speaking, uh, you and I, we wouldn't want to go to the cross. We don't like to die. You say, well, I'm going to go to be with the Lord, but we're not in a hurry. And Jesus in his humanity was not in a hurry to die. And he sweat as it were great drops of blood as he anticipated the brutality and the pain uh, of the execution of the cross under the Roman jurisdiction. Just as any human being, you could say, oh, he thought, well, I'm God, it's no big deal. He hurt. It was pain so excruciating that, he could, that the only thing that ever made him cry out. And he was crying out because he was bearing the sins of the world, not that excruciating pain, if you can imagine. I don't know about you, if I hit my finger with a hammer, I cry out. <laughs> and sometimes I use words that I probably shouldn't use, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, but Jesus didn't cry out. He was like the lamb uh, who is sheer, uh, uh, gets sheared uh, of his uh, wool and doesn't cry out. Now, I've watched lambs being sheared. Most of them do a little meh, meh. Jesus didn't even do meh, nothing. But when he was bearing the sins of the world, he cried out, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Addressing who? The Father and the Holy Spirit, the other members of the Trinity. Nevertheless, he was a human being, truly, but he was undiminished deity as well. Well, uh, that's the overview. Here's some passages. We'll just go through the ones that we already had in the book of Hebrews. So uh, just follow with me as we track through some scripture, which never hurts us, of course. In Hebrews chapter 1, we'll start in verse 6, where we see the uh, humanity of Jesus Christ right here in verse 6. In verse 6, it says, And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, this is what we call second advent. Early in the book of Hebrews, he's addressing the return of Jesus Christ. So for those Hebrews who don't believe that he came the first time, here he's addressing the second time. They understand that. But of course, the word again indicates that, oh, he must have come once before. So that's addressing to these Hebrew believers that uh, many had missed his first advent and rejected him, but they're going to get to see him at the second advent if they believe. So that's 1 6. Then we go to chapter 2 and chapter 2, verse 14. And there it says, Since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Well, children here are members of the human race, kind of a, uh, a metaphor for all human beings. We're God's children in the sense that he has created uh, human beings. And he says he partook of the same, that through death, physical death as well as spiritual death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is even the devil. Yes, there is a devil. That's a subject for another time. There's some people who say, well, I don't believe in a devil. Well, I don't care what you believe in. Scripture says there is one. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, looking around at society today and the world, uh, the idea that there's no devil uh, begs the question. Uh, we see evil on every corner and so many people that actually are servants of Satan himself, otherwise known as the devil. Then go to chapter 5. Chapter 5 earlier, chapter 5 and verse 7. In verse 7 it says, In the days of his flesh, when he offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to him who was able to save him. This is when he was bearing the sins from noon till three, but mostly right around three o'clock, about that ninth hour, when he was bearing the sins of the world. He cried out again and again because the pain of bearing your sin and my sin and the sin of every member of the human race was excruciating. We can't even imagine that. You feel bad when you stub your toe, when you get a splinter in your finger, or when you hit your finger with a hammer. Nothing compared to that. People have great pain. I had a gallbladder attack. It was excruciating. Nothing. Nothing compared with the pain that Jesus Christ bore when he took the sins of the world into his body and into his soul. But it was a body. And who has heard because of his piety? That, of course, refers back to Isaiah 53, where they didn't listen uh, and said they won't hear, they won't listen. And, of course, many did not in that first century. Many do not today. We give the gospel and people poo-poo it. They make fun. They mock the Christians. Oh, yeah, you believe that silly Bible. Yes, we certainly do believe that Bible, and we don't find it silly. And when you enter the lake of fire, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you won't think it was so silly either. But uh, we would like you to not have to do that. All right, and then we go to chapter 10 and verse 5, and that's our verse. And uh, we'll, of course, go back there to chapter 10 and verse 5. And we see here, a body thou hast prepared for me, physically physical humanity, Jesus Christ had a body. Then we see it many other places. For example, one that I have mentioned, I think we looked at it last time. We'll go there quickly because we see that John uh, put in 2 John, in his second epistle, in verse 7, a specific with regard to this. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, apparently, uh, then and now, that rejected that he was a human being. He was just a spirit. Uh, he was uh, ethereal and not really there and stuff like that. So they actually did in verse 7. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Not so much the antichrist of the future, although he will reject Christ. But anyone is anti or against Christ who rejects his humanity. So right there. And then we have it in other places. Uh, we could go to... Uh, for example, uh, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 52, uh, 13 through 53, 12. And without going through all of those, I'll just give you those. 52, 13 and 50 to 53, 12. So it's the entire 
53rd chapter, and there we see that he bore in his own body. Well, we better go there. I, I hate to not go to these passages. I know that you'll go home and look them all up, but just in case you don't. <laughs> Isaiah 52. I don't know about you, but that page almost falls out of my Bible here. I've looked at it so often. Isaiah 52, beginning in verse 13, it says, Behold, my servant, singular, will prosper. Here's where many of the rabbis, even to this day, believe that's referring to Israel. It could be, but it isn't. Uh, he, he will be on high and lifted up. Well, uh, Israel will be high and lifted up. Uh, I don't know that that's ever happened historically. Now, Jesus Christ was high and lifted up when he was hung on that cross as the serpent in the wilderness that Moses was to make. But also he is high that he is at the right hand of the Father, and he is exalted, and greatly exalted would refer to that, not his cross work, but his seat at the right hand of the Father. Just as many were astonished at you, my people. Now here he goes to the second person plural, my servant singular, and in the same way many were astonished at you, my people. Looks like the people are different from the person in the first part of verse 13. There he's talking about a singular servant. And here he's saying in the same way that people were astonished, amazed at the Hebrew people. Seems like a different group. Seems like a multiple group rather than a singular person. But there's a lot more. And so he says, so his appearance, referring back to Jesus, was marred more than any man. Humanity of Jesus more than any other man, his appearance. If you've ever seen the Passion of Christ, although there were certainly some things that we would disagree with in that particular uh, depiction, that film, nevertheless, the brutality that they demonstrated and pictured in that movie, if it doesn't bring you to tears, I don't know what would. So visualizing what Christ must have gone uh, undergone on the cross and before the cross, just a, a, a marvelous presentation of that pain and agony. And his form more than the sons of man, men. Again, thus he will sprinkle many nations. Now this moves to a metaphor. How does this man sprinkle many nations? This is not Israel sprinkling the nations. Well, you can say, well, they're all in all over the world. That, no, this is referring to sprinkling in the same way that the high priest would sprinkle the blood on the various uh, parts of the tabernacle, uh, the various furnishings, and of course, ultimately on the Day of Atonement on the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. He would sprinkle. So here, it's a reference to that. He, individual, Third person singular, he will sprinkle many nations. That is, those nations who believe in Jesus Christ come under the blood and the work of his saving grace. And then he says here, kings will shut their mouths on account of them? No, on account of him. They said, well, this is Jacob referring to the nation of Israel. Well, we've already seen the people plural in verse 13. Here we go back to the third person singular, he, on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. They're going to see this. If they don't see it in the first advent, they're going to see it in the second advent. Uh, and what they had not heard, they will understand. Malachi and other passages teach us uh, that in the eventual uh, outcome at the end of the tribulation, all Israel will mourn as of a beloved son when they recognize that their Savior was. Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. And on and on. We won't go through all this. Look at verse 3 in the next chapter. It says, He was despised and forsaken of men. He, third person singular, a man, not Israel as a people, as some rabbis suggest, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Of course, all through his life, he had grief. You say, what grief did Christ have? Seeing that people rejected him. Have you ever been rejected? Doesn't it grieve you when somebody may say you're a liar, a slanderer, a false prophet, as they did with Jesus? You know, you're a blasphemer. Anyone ever said that? That would grieve your soul in his humanity. He was grieved. He came and he was the son of man. He was the son of God. And he came to save the world. And they spit in his face. Literally, those soldiers spit in his face when he was getting prepared for the crucifixion. A man of sorrows, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. We, in the past here, the perfect tense indicates we, that is the Hebrew people, it's a prophetic, what we call a futuristic perfect. 
We here, we did not esteem him. The perfect tense indicates past action and it's prophetic. So it's what we call a prophetic perfect. It looks at the future. Believers will, uh, unbelievers will not esteem him. His own people won't esteem him. And it goes on and on and so forth. Surely our griefs and guilt uh, he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. And we esteemed him stricken smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. Well, I don't want to go any further uh, for your homework. If you haven't studied this with us, we've gone through this word by word and verse by verse, but the deity of Christ is here spoken of as well as his humanity. Uh, the deity of Christ uh, we see uh, towards the end where it talks about the fact that he is going to come back. Let's see if I can find that very quickly here. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, mm. Let's see. Oh, here it is in verse 11. As a result of the anguish or sorrow of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. That's the father. And by the knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Verse 12. Therefore, I will allot him, that is God the father is allotting to Jesus Christ, him, a portion a portion is like the spoils of victory a king would get when he came back from combat and he would distribute the spoils of victory to his people and the higher echelon. And so I will allot him, Jesus Christ, the spoils with the great. Who are the great? They're the believers in Jesus Christ in the kingdom. And he will divide the booty, there it is, with the strong. Those would be the believers with maximum doctrine who are gaining the rewards in eternity. Um, and so why? Because he purged out himself unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. And finally, he himself bore the sins of the many and interceded for the transgressors. So we just see this powerful prophetic passage by the great prophet Isaiah uh, dealing here with particularly his humanity, but also his deity is in view. And so we see that in the Old Testament. And of course we have, uh, uh, I think I've got time, we probably have to come back the next hour and we'll look at his deity, but I want to continue here just another couple of verses. So uh, you can look over at uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians a church that was confused about a lot of things. And in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, one of the truly great chapters of this epistle dealing with resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it says here, uh, For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. You can't bury a spirit. <laughs> you bury physical bodies. He was buried and that he was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scripture. And then he appeared to the disciples. And so we see this particular passage actually also endorses his humanity. Well, uh, we've kind of gone through the humanity of Christ. There are many other passages. We may look at one or two more in the second hour. So when we come back after our break, do join us for the second hour. We do start at uh, 1115. And then we're going to look at the deity of Christ. Was he really God? Or was he just a human being that meant well and a prophet? Not so. He was both God, undiminished deity, perfect and true humanity, and he added to it the work of salvation. He is the God man savior. Father God, we thank you so much for this information, recognizing who our savior was as part of your triune essence. Nevertheless, that he took upon himself as a, a custodian of the vote of the three of you to come into human history, to live a sinless life, to become, as it were, the second Adam, and to take upon himself the sins and the griefs and the sorrows of all of us, to bear the sins of the entire world, and to do it once and for all time, so that those of us who are the recipients can simply believe in the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, and have everlasting life. Not only that, but we have the forgiveness of sin, we have a future resurrection body. We have a seat at the table in heaven when we come to be with your son and when he comes back for us so that we might share in the marriage supper of the lamb and the bride to be, which is the body now, and we become that bride. All these things, plus 
thousands of blessings and rewards in eternity as well. We look forward to that. We recognize I had not seen, neither has it entered into the hearts of men, the things that you have prepared for those who love you. We thank you, Father. And yet for that one person who's here this morning, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know God had you in mind when he sent his son into human history to die for your sins as well as my sins. And he bought your debt that you owed, eternal damnation. And because of his finished work on the cross, once and for all time, once and for all people, you simply by believing in Jesus Christ can have right now, right where you sit, in the privacy of your own soul, eternal life. Won't you do it before you leave? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John tells us that he wrote in his epistles and in his gospel things to those who believe in the name of the Son of God that they could know, know, the Greek word there means to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that they have everlasting life. God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his uniquely appointed, his only born son, that whoever, anybody, whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, again, thank you for freedom. Thank you for the opportunity to study. What an honor it is to teach your word. What a privilege it is to study and hear your word. We pray that all who are hearing this will be blessed, not by the words that I have given, but by the words that you have put into my mouth and therefore blessed by your word and by you, Father. You are the blesser of all of us and the recipients as of your blessing. We thank you for these things now. We pray it in the marvelous name of our Lord and Savior, High Priest Jesus Christ. Amen.